All right, well, we'll look again, please, at our kind of theme verse for today, which is 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5. We'll just read it again and we'll take up our topic that we began in the last session on helps and hindrances to doing the work of an evangelist. So again, uh, uh, verse 5, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry. And as we've been thinking about the various helps, we've talked uh, about tears and uh, uh, William Booth's famous telegram to his laborers, try tears. Uh, We've talked about the, the helper, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We've talked about testimony using personal testimony, and we've talked about travailing over souls. And now I want to think uh, about hindrances. What's really hindering the church as a, as a whole and us as individuals from being effective in doing the work of an evangelist? And again, we're going to have a similar letter, but this time the letter U is going to be our key letter in this session. And I want to begin with uh, the, the thought of unbelief. Could that be a hindrance to our effectiveness in being good evangelists for our Savior, the Lord Jesus? And there's no question that unbelief does have an impact on uh, the work of God. And if you look at uh, Matthew's gospel just for a second, I want to look at several references and pull them all together on this theme of unbelief. And again, I'm sharing with you these things because they're things that that the Lord has been convicting me of personally and uh, questions I've been asking in my own heart uh, about the work of God in our generation. And uh, in Matthew 13 and verse uh, 58 speaking uh, our Lord Jesus speaking it says and he did not many mighty works there in this one area and he says because of their unbelief that amazing that that the savior of the world was hindered in the work in a certain area and what hindered it was the unbelief of the people. Turn with me to the epistle to the Hebrews now, please. Just want to keep thinking about this idea of unbelief. And Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And verse 12. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Take, take heed, brethren, Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now down in verse 19. So we see, speaking of the generation in the wilderness wanderings. Remember, an 11-day journey took them 40 years because a whole generation literally had to die out. And it says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Isn't that amazing? An 11-day journey took 40 years. And basically, for 40 years... All they did was walk around in circles and attend funerals of unbelieving people. Can you imagine how hard that must have been for Joshua and Caleb? Like, what do you do for the last 40 years? I went to funerals. They they literally watched a whole generation die out. They made no progress for God. They just went in circles and then they passed away. Do you want to be part of a generation that just goes on round in circles until they die? 
makes no progress whatsoever, doesn't take the land, doesn't inherit what God has for them. They just go around in circles until they die, and then we go to their future. Is that, is that what we want to be part of? The cause of it was unbelief. They didn't believe God, even though they'd seen God do amazing things. Do you remember they saw him part the Red Sea? They saw the plagues of Egypt. They saw, the, they, they saw God is powerful, and yet... Because of unbelief, a generation went around in circles. And he said, don't you be like that. Don't, don't you be like that. Don't you have, and I, I find that amazing. He says, don't you have an evil heart of unbelief? Isn't that amazing? Evil heart? It it's kind of uh, blows my mind when I think about it. Because if you were to ask me, Tell me about what evil looks like. And I think of somebody, you know, some axe murderer or, you know, something. In my mind, I've got this conception of what evil is. And God said, you know what really is evil? Not to believe me. That's really evil. That you don't believe my promises. You don't believe my power. You don't believe who I am and what I can do. That's really evil. And I ask myself, am I part of a generation who are just going in circles till we die out? Are we going around in circles till our assemblies die out? A lot of assemblies I used to preach in, I don't preach in them anymore. They don't exist anymore. They're dead. They're gone. They're closed. The doors are closed. And the interesting thing is, some of them were like that for a long time before the doors actually closed. Ichabod was already written over the door, right? And why? What happened? Could it be unbelief? Look at Psalm 78. I want you just to see that unbelief really does have an impact on things. Psalm 78, verse 41. Yea, they turned back, speaking again about this generation, and tempted God, and then notice this last phrase, and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. And I, I think about that and I say, how do you limit the illimitable God? I, I'm not sure whether illimitable is a word, but it sounds good, doesn't it? But, but how do you limit a God who really doesn't have limits to what he can do? And God says, I'll tell you how you do that. You don't believe me. Right? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and what? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so I ask the question, Lord, uh, am I guilty of not really believing you? I know that I believed you when I was saved, and, and that generation believed God when he parted the, the Red Sea, but after a while, they, they saw the giants and they didn't see the Lord anymore, right? Isn't that what happened? They believed the testimony of the 10 spies who saw the giants, and they didn't see the Lord anymore, all they could see. And it's possible in our generation to see all the problems of this age and to get our eyes off the Lord. And because we're so focused on the problems, we just say, well, you know, we're living in the last days. What else can you expect? I, I hear people say this stuff all the time. Well, listen, in the darkest here, e e period in human history, the Great Tribulation period, you know what's going to happen? There'll be a great multitude saved and nobody can even count them. So if God is going to do that in the darkest period in human history, could he not do it today? He is doing it today in other parts of the world. He is. Could he not do it here? Or is it that we just don't believe him? Look at Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 20. 
the disciples, um, he said, well, verse 17, he said, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. This is a man that uh, was demon-possessed. The disciples couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus rebuked the devil. He departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, how, how much faith did they have to have? Quantified mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's not like we're talking about a lot. See, it's not the amount of faith, it's where the faith is placed, isn't it? And if you could just trust me, I could move a mountain for you. Isn't that amazing? What, what a God that can move mountains. So can he, can he move in my generation and move to reach the millennials with the gospel and all their plugged in, gen can he do that? Yes, he can. But do I believe him? Look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. <clears throat> and verse 24. Well, let's just uh, let's break in further up the story. Um, again, uh, verse 21. He asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child, and oftentimes this demon it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He's asking the Lord Jesus, if you can do anything. Can he do anything? Well, <laughs> he can do plenty of things, can't he? Can you do anything and have compassion? Does our Lord Jesus have compassion? Oh, he's so compassionate. The man says, help us. Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. That's a great prayer, isn't it? Since I have been convicted personally through the scriptures about the question of do I really believe God, my wife and I in our prayers together, one of the things we keep saying is, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief, right? Or another way is, Lord, increase our faith, right? I want to be a man of faith. It's amazing. We read Hebrews 11 uh, that we just talked about, that, that chapter when we talked about without faith it's impossible to please God. And then there's a whole generation of heroes and it says as it begins to tell their story, it always begins with this idea, by, by what? By faith. They did great things for God, but it was only on the principle of their confidence, their faith in the living God. That's what it was. And I don't believe that God has changed in his dealings with men. He can take up the weakest man and use him greatly if that man will just believe God and trust him. And so again, I ask the question, could it be that part of the reason we're part of a generation that seems to be just going around in circles until we die out is because we really don't believe God. Like we say and we even sing like we believe. Like we talk about the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, right? Do you believe that though? You ought to, 
Your life is a demonstration of it. Like if we heard more testimonies, may we be more confident that look at what God has done in the lives of these individuals. And so there's a sense in which we're saying, Lord, help us. I, I, I don't want to be going around in circles. I want to move forward with you and take this generation for the Lord Jesus. I will build my church. Do I believe that? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do I believe that? Do I believe it? Lord, I believe it. Help my unbelief, right? Increase my faith. Help me to be a person who lives by faith. We talk about the just shall live by faith. And for years, I've read that verse, and I always saw it as the moment you're saved. Now, of course, it is the moment you're saved. You're justified when you believe. But it doesn't say the just shall believe by faith. It says the just shall what? Live by faith. So what that means is I, I trusted Christ for my eternal destiny. But guess what it also means? I have to trust him today to make me useful, to make me effective, to stop me going around in circles, going nowhere fast. It, it's, it's a constant walk by faith. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Well, how did you receive Christ Jesus by the Lord? By faith. How are you supposed to walk every single day? By faith, right? It's from start to finish, the Christian life is a life of faith. And yet, I want to suggest to you that I believe our generation is captivated by unbelief. We don't. We have, we, what do we expect God to do? I think that the average New Testament assembly in North America, if you ask them what their expectation was for God to work this year, they would look at you and they wouldn't know how to answer. Because I, I want to suggest to you that their only expectation is they might survive the year but they don't expect to turn their neighborhood upside down. <laughs> they don't expect to have new converts week after week after week. They don't expect to have baptisms on and on. They, their expectation level is minuscule. And God says, I'll meet you right at your expectation level, right? I think that's what God is doing. He's sure, if you don't believe me, that's all right. You can carry on playing church and go around in circles if you want. But won't some of you just dare to believe me for something bigger? I believe unbelief is a tremendous hindrance and one I've been guilty of. Just buying into this hang on till the rapture kind of business. White knuckle ride, but at least we're going to heaven someday. Let's just hold on. Circle the wagons. It's all over. No wonder we're dying. Right? We've lost that sense of vision, purpose, and faith in what God can do in this generation. I love this story of Chuck Smith, uh, the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement. I don't know if you know anything about Calvary Chapels, but they, a lot of hippies in the, in the 70s came to Christ through Chuck Smith's ministry. But um, he, was, uh, he and his wife, they took a day off once a week and, uh, from his pastoral ministries. They had a congregation, I don't know, 30 people, something like that. And not much happening, but um, anyway, they, um, uh, Chuck Smith um, and his wife would go and they'd, they'd just go to the beach. And of course, it was the 70s and everybody's going to San Francisco, and when you get to San Francisco, you realize how cold it is. Nobody wants to stay in San Francisco, so they all kind of go to Southern California and they hang out on the beach. And so there's all these hippies. So as, as he sits there, Chuck says, I looked at them, and I said, what those guys need is a haircut and a job. That was his attitude. His wife, she looked at them, and she said, God reached this generation with the gospel. And she began to pray earnestly that God would reach this hippie generation. And her husband, he kept saying, they need a haircut, they need a job. 
That's all he could think of. You know, that's, that's exactly what I would think, right? When you, you see somebody, you know, kind of uh, uh, at, the, at the intersection, you know, kind of uh, will work for money kind of thing, and what you think is, that guy needs to get a haircut and a job. You know, that, I don't have much mercy, really. She begins to pray, earnestly begins to pray for these people. Anyway, eventually one of Chuck's girls brings the boyfriend home, and guess what he looks like? <laughs> one of these hippies. <laughs> and so as there, his first thought is, that guy needs to get, I <laughs> couldn't get a job. You know, that's all he's thinking. But she begins to say, the Lord's answering prayer. I've been praying for these guys. Anyway, they were able to lead this guy to the Lord. And before long, their sitting room was full of hippies. And God began to reach that generation through Chuck Smith because of the vision and faith of his wife, who saw more than people who needed a job and a haircut, saw lost souls that needed a savior, and began to pray, Lord, somebody reach that generation. That's what we need, isn't it? Eyes with vision, eyes that believe God, eyes that have expectation that God wants to save that generation. Do we believe the word of God when the Lord Jesus says, he's not willing that any should perish? Do we believe that? That God says he'll have all men to be saved. Do we believe that? And that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Do we believe that? Lord, I believe, help Thou, mine unbelief, Lord, help me to be a person of faith, to be a person of expectation, to be a person who's not content to walk in circles until I die. I, God's got something better for us than that, doesn't he? What kind of generation will we be? Lord, deliver us from an evil heart of unbelief. And then... Um, another you, and that's the unconfessed sin. I want you to look at Joshua, please, chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, and you, you, you probably know exactly the story I'm going to. It's, it's how the sin of an individual impacted a whole nation. Joshua 7 it says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Notice how God looks at it. He says, the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. This is Joshua 7, verse 1. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, I want to explain something that I think we don't really get in the West like we should. In the West, we're a very individualistic society, and we tend to think from an individual viewpoint. In the East, they think in a corporate way. Okay? In other words, they think about the whole. And the Word of God speaks about the whole, doesn't it? And so, so what we've got here is this, this whole nation and their spiritual progress was held back because of one secret sin in the midst of the camp. And they, they were, went up against a tiny little city called Ai. They'd already come from an amazing victory at Jericho. Now they get to Ai and the, the, the people of Ai had them running scared. Isn't that amazing? And Joshua, he falls down on his face, and he, he's just devastated, and, he, he, and, and he's crying out to the Lord. What's happening? If Ai send us pack in, what are the rest of the Canaanites going to think? They're going to think we're a pushover, right? It's all over. <clears throat> and he, and he, what's going to become of your great name, O God? What's going to happen if we continue like this? Does sin in a local assembly affect the corporate testimony even when it's not known about? <clears throat> Peter Brandon is an 
he's with the Lord now, but he was an evangelist in England. He died last year um, and um, was greatly used in the gospel in the British Isles and in South Africa and in Australia, a very effective communicator of the gospel and a tremendous man of prayer. I, I know people who hosted him when he was over here for gospel campaigns, and they said oftentimes they could hear him all night long crying out to God in prayer. He was a tremendous man of prayer. But <clears throat> I know this is a true story. He was having gospel campaign in England, and they'd had two weeks of meetings, and there were unbelievers out every single night, and nobody was coming to Christ. He was preaching. He felt like he was clearly preaching the gospel. He was praying, and yet he realized there's something hindering here. And at the end of the two weeks... He asked everybody to leave at the end of the last meeting who wasn't in fellowship in that church. He said, if you're not in fellowship in this assembly, we'd like you to leave. And then he went to the back door and he locked the door and he said, nobody leaves until we find out what's hindering. So everybody sat there looking at each other. I mean, you can imagine you could cut the atmosphere with a knife, couldn't you? And eventually, a, a young little lad stands up and confesses some minor transgression, you know, that he'd stolen a cookie out of the cookie jar. Nothing big, but he just confesses, and the dam breaks. And people start tapping each other on the shoulder and saying, I've had a rotten attitude towards you. Would you please forgive me? And they start to get right, confess their sin, deal with sin. And so he said, okay, now we'll go on for another week. The third week, 100 souls came to Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Now, I want to tell you that I believe that part of the reason the powerlessness of the church of Jesus Christ in our generation is the amount of secret sins that are carried out by the saints of God. The reason this powerlessness in the gospel is because we're a holy priesthood who are living unholy lives. That's the reason why. And, and because we're, we're really, uh, this sin is being harbored in our, and then all of a sudden it breaks out. That's the idea of leprosy. You see, there's something going on and you can't really see it, but then all of a sudden it breaks out. And the one thing about sin is that it can't be hidden forever. It does come out. And when it comes out, of course, the testimony devastate, is devastated. And so, again, we want to ask ourselves the question. We're trying to analyze, is there a reason why we're not effectively doing the work of an evangelist? And I'm suggesting that as well as unbelief, that it also could be that we're being hindered and crippled because there's sin in the camp. And the average assembly, there's sin in the camp. And maybe at Tepsi, there could be sin in the camp. Right? God knows your secret life. You can't hide it from Him. Even though you, you might do something in the dark and in secret, it's not hidden from Him. But He wants you to bring everything into the light. And confess it. And not just confess it, walk away from it. I've confessed sin in the past, even knowing I was going to go back and do it again. I wasn't really repentant. I wasn't really broken. Eventually, the Lord has his way of getting you there, where you say, Lord, I'm done and I'm not going back. By the grace of God, I'm finished with that sin. We need people to get to that place, right? If we're going to have power with God, we have to walk intimately with God. James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And he's writing to Christians, people who are born again. He says it in chapter 1, and he says to these people, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so I believe that sin is a tremendous hindrance to our effectiveness for Christ Unconfessed sin results in unheard prayers. If I regard iniquity in my heart, what does it say? The Lord will not hear me. 
You think, you want me to do this, you want me to do that, but you've got some business you need to do first. Then I'll do this and that, but you've got to start by dealing with your unconfessed sin, right? <clears throat> Let's go to that James 4 passage just for a moment, because I want to suggest to you that one of the big sins of our generation, and particularly connected with our churches is James 4. This passage that deals so beautifully with intimacy with Christ, the, the idea of drawing near and He drawing near to you so that you're, you're enjoying that, that intimacy of relationship that God wants you to have. But I want us to break in in verse 6. Notice he says, But he gives more grace, wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And I, I thought, it's, when I read that passage, that to me so clearly talks about the promise of intimacy with the Lord, draw near, and he says, I'll draw near to you. Isn't that a great promise, by the way? Do you want intimacy with the Lord? I want to tell you, there's, there's nothing to be compared on planet Earth like intimacy with our Lord. Draw near to me, I will draw near. So you're kind of enjoying that closeness of fellowship. But that whole passage, verse 6, begins with, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble, and it ends with, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, verse 10, and he will lift you up. And so what God is saying is, one of the things that is really going to hinder you ever enjoying intimacy with me is if you're guilty of spiritual pride. He said, I have, I have no option but to resist the proud. But I, will, I have lots of grace that I want to give. But the only people that I'll do business with are the humble. Isn't that interesting? And I think that one of the dangers of being involved in a so-called New Testament church is that a lot of it stinks with pride. Like we are the assemblies. Do you see anything wrong with that statement? I think it smacks of pride. It's like nobody else is, right? We're the exclusive ones, right? We are the assemblies, you know? Everything about it, you know, we, we're carrying out New Testament truth. Now, again, I love these principles, don't get me wrong, but everything we do, we have to do it with humility, right? Not with arrogance, not with swagger, not with cockiness. And our hearts are so easily puffed up with pride. By the way, you Tepsi students, you heard what Chris said, this exacting, demanding course, all the rest of it. You know one of the greatest dangers you face as students? You're getting a lot of knowledge in a short space of time. And you know what the Bible tells me about knowledge? It puffs up. And so it's, it's easy to walk out of a place like this, and I'm going to straighten the church out. You know how I know that? I went to Bible school once too. And you know when I came out of Bible school? I'll be honest with you, I was obnoxious obnoxious. Lots of experience. I mean, lots of knowledge. Lots of knowledge. Zero experience. And I'm going to straighten the church out. And the Lord says to people like that, I'm going to take you to the backside of the desert for a while to let you know that you're a nobody. And God has his school. And some of you might graduate from here, and God may have to take you to his school, which could be the backside of the desert, where he has to show you that all that knowledge means nothing unless you learn to walk with God.
humbly walk with God. And it's a danger. It's a, we're at, you're in, a, I, I cannot, in one sense, I, I love that time because I, I love that, the privilege of being able to devote myself to studying the Word of God, but it was so spiritually dangerous because you can get cocky. And God has no option, no option but to resist. So maybe some of our meetings need to repent of their swagger that we're the assemblies. Do you know what I mean by that? I I love these principles, but again, how come God is blessing churches that in our opinion are so unbiblical in the way they meet. And we're not seeing any blessing. Could it be that spiritual pride is actually killing us? And that instead of God being for us, he's actually resisting us because we stink of pride. God only uses the humble and the contrite. We started our class on Romans by talking about Paul, and his name means little. And I said, you know what? God only uses little men. And I'm not thinking in terms of stature, but he only uses little men. If you think you're something, God says, okay, you go ahead and be something. (laughs) But you know who I'm committed to? I'm committed to the weak and foolish things of this world. R.A. Torrey was asked, why was D.L. Moody so effective in his service for God? And R.A. Torrey said, D.L. Moody had never heard of himself. D.L. Moody had never heard of himself. In other words, he was a humble man, and God could use him. And then our final you. So we've got unbelief, we've got unconfessed sin, resulting in unheard prayers. And then finally, uncaring. If we're gonna be effective in evangelism, we cannot allow the apathy of this generation to affect us. You see, um, apathy is an interesting word. And if I was to describe the church in North America in one word, I would use the word apathetic. That would be my descriptive term. And um, enjoy words, actually, I really do. And um, uh, apathy is a very interesting word. Um, When you see uh, words that have an A at the beginning, uh, it usually means no. So somebody who theologically is a millennial means they do not believe in a thousand year reign of Christ. They're a millennial. Uh, the word amusement, uh, it muses think. A is no, right? And no think generation. By the way, if ever we were living in an amusement generation, this is it, isn't it? Not thinking, zoning out, gaming, all this kind of stuff. It's a no think generation. Apathy, a, no, pathos, feeling, unfeeling, unmoved, going through the motions, just, no, nothing there. And uh, in terms of evangelism, we've already, we've already talked about things like tears and travail and and compassion, and we've, you know, we've, we've, we've given the idea that, that what really wins, what's really convincing, is when we feel the hurt of the masses, when we feel something about their plight, when we're, we're moved like lo- the Lord Jesus was with compassion, and when we're apathetic, which means we just don't care or couldn't care less. How do we break out of an apathetic generation? Right, because it, are we affected by that? Sure we are, aren't we? Aren't we affected by our generation? 
And so, Lord, um, help me in, the, in these areas. I, I don't want to be uh, somebody who's apathetic. Uh, another way you could say apathetic is, um, is lukewarm. That is no passion. Dispassionate. When I first came into fellowship in an assembly in Florida back in 1989, it was not unusual for men at the Lord's Supper, as they spoke lovingly of their Savior, to begin to weep. It wasn't unusual. I don't see that very often anymore. I don't know if you see it, but I see a generation that not much feeling, not moved, not uh, just going through the motions. And, and part of it is, um, maybe culturally, uh, our assemblies have been greatly affected by the British Isles, and the British Isles, I'm an Englishman, were known for stiff upper lip, you know, never show your emotions. And we're nervous about emotions, aren't we? I want to tell you, God is interested in your whole person. He wants your intellect, he wants your will, and he wants your emotions as well. It's all right to weep, isn't it? Is it? Must be up. My Savior did it, right? And, and so, Lord, deliver us from this unfeeling, unemotional, apathetic generation that the Lord describes. He says, I wish you were hot or cold. Isn't that interesting? But he says, the problem with you guys, paraphrase, is you just lukewarm lukewarm. And he says, you know what that does to me? I find it most nauseating, an apathetic church. All around us, masses are going into a Christless eternity, and I don't see much concern in prayer, much travail. All around us, lampstands are being removed. And I don't see calls for a day of prayer and repentance and fasting. I just see, oh well, it's the day we're living in. What I see is an apathetic response to an awful crisis. And it bothers me. It really does. <clears throat> And I want to suggest to you that part of the problem with apathy is linked with what we said earlier, and that is unbelief. We just don't really believe God. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Lord, do something to my generation to remove the unbelief to make us passionate about holiness and see the insidious danger of allowing unconfessed sin to go on in our lives. And Lord, do something about us to drive away this uncompassionate, unfeeling, going through the motions type of Christianity. Now, I hope you've not been discouraged by these messages today, because I. I know that everybody would like to hear a nice, happy, jolly kind of ministry, right? But that's really not the diagnosis we need right now. We need to face reality. We need to allow the scriptures to speak to our hearts. Lord, speak to my heart, right? I don't want to just be part of a going around in circles generation. I think you've got something much better for us. Do you? I think he does. And yet, it really, I can't affect anybody else. I just have to start with me. The Lord is dealing with my wife and I, showing us our unbelief, showing us our prayerlessness, showing us these things. And I thank him for that. I'm thankful that he's not left us to carry on like we were. May the Lord affect all of us. 
this day that we say, Lord, I, I, I don't want to be like that. Start in me. Bring a transformation to your church and start right here in my heart. And Lord, help me to believe you. Help me to be a man of faith or a woman of faith who believes you for more than I'm seeing right now with my physical eyes. In teaching through Romans, one of my favorite little passages as we went through it together was in Romans chapter 4. And this is a great place in my mind to, to end as we think about our day together. And I want to break in in verse 7. It says, as it is written, I have made thee, speaking of Abraham, Romans 4, 17, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and call us those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And I love this. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. If he's looking at natural circumstances, the chances of him being the father of many nations is absolutely zero, right? If his eyes are on the circumstances, I'm dead, my wife is dead as well, her womb is dead. It's all over, folks, if it's, if it's depending on us. And yet it says in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that that which he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And if you can just bear with me one second, I realize it's talking about an example of justifying faith. But I want to say it's, it's there for more than just that example. It's an example to us of somebody who has not got his eyes on the circumstances, but on the promises of God. And that's good for us, isn't it? Get your eyes off what you can see and get your eyes on him who promised, I will build my church and believe him. Stagger not at the promise of God through unbelief. Believe it, act upon it, and let's see what the Lord will do. It says he was strong in faith, and at the end of it all, it says this, giving glory to God. And when we live by faith, what we're doing is we're giving all the glory to God because it's only what he did, not what I did. He gets it, doesn't he? And that magnifies him. It makes him look big. Make us a generation that don't look at the deadness we see around us, but look to thee, the living God, to change everything. And start right here with this cold, hard heart. Make it a compassionate heart like your sons. Take away the unbelief. Increase my faith. May the Lord help us as we consider these hindrances to doing the work of an evangelist. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief.